So, are we all ready to start? Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and um, it's, uh, you know, St. Patrick's Day today, so I'm surprised everybody isn't uh, drinking Guinness as we're all about to go to later on. Um, but thanks for coming, and the subject of this lecture is really just the Hebrides, and my qualification for talking about the Hebrides uh, really is three things. Firstly, I'm Scottish, and therefore, obviously, I've grown up with the lore and legends of the Hebrides. Um, but I'm not from the islands myself. The Hebridean uh, islands, the Hebrides really are just all the islands off the west coast of Scotland, with the exception of this one here, these ones that are in the Clyde, which I'll say a little bit about later on. I lived for 13 years on this island here, the Isle of Isla, which has eight whiskey distilleries, and I gather it's about to start a ninth one. It's a splendid place to live. And in fact, I lived right down on the south coast there in the uh, distillery village called Lagabullet. I don't know if any, any of you are uh, connoisseurs of single malt whiskey, but Lagabullet is 16 year old as well. As well. And uh, the, my third qualification is I've actually written two books about sailing around the islands. I, I lived, when I lived in Lagabullet Bay, I had a boat, um, and I wrote a book really sailing around the Hebrides, which is called Isles of the West over there, and that was a terrific success and was a sort of bestseller, and the publisher said, write another one. And so I did what I call Isles of the North, which concerns the islands off the north coast of Scotland, the Orkneys and the Shetland Islands, and then we sailed over to Norway with the idea of having a look at how, making some comparisons between the way the islands in Scotland are run and the islands in Norway are run, because we're always told that Norway is fantastically sensible, don't think like that. <laughs> uh, and it is, of course, although it's, it's very boring. Um, it's, it's a wonderful country, a lovely country, but it is so dull compared with Scotland. Um, but I, I, one little story is, uh, no, it's okay, thank you, my hand, it's okay, um, is that, we came back across the North Sea to, to here, to the, uh, because we sailed up that way, up to the north of the coast there. We came back and came to sail down through the lo along Loch Ness and through the Great Glen and back down that way. And when we got here to Inverness, um, for the first and last time in my life, uh, we got off the boat. We realized it was getting quite late because we could take us ages to get into Inverness and there was no wind and it was slow going. The tide was slightly against us. We tied up at the, the uh, along the pier, the entrance to the canal, and there's a famous place called the Alpnahari Inn. And my companion that was on the boat with me and I, we ran to the pub to make sure we were in there before closing time to have some bites of Guinness and uh, look at the landlord's black-eyed daughter and, and a few toasties and just enjoy mad life after a month in Norway. So anyway, that's ours in the north. Although. Um, the, uh, the, the tales of Norway are very interesting. It's an interesting place to read about, but I wouldn't want to live there. But that's Isles of the North. But Isles of the West is the book that's about the Hebrides, and I'll concentrate on the Hebrides here. And I've put up there, firstly, my name, and also my email address, if any, if any of you wish to get in touch with me or ask for details of where to get hold of the book, because they're all available on Amazon. Um, and you can buy them in Kindle form, hard copy, or what have you. So um, you can... Like they're all, I've got cards if, if need be, you can ask me afterwards. So, what I thought I would do is I'll do this thing in three little bits. The first bit I'll give a very, very brief history of the Hebrides. Uh, second bit, I will talk a little bit about the islands themselves, what they are just like as physical places. And finally, a short bit, I will just talk a little bit about the situation of the islands today. And the reason for that is because when my publisher, I'd written another book about laws, I think, completely separate to this, and it was a critical success. And the publisher said, well, will you write a book about the island? And my condition to him was, I said, I'm happy to, happy to do that, as long as I write about the islands today. Because there have been so many books written about the islands in the past, and the history of them, <coughs> which is extremely interesting, extremely romantic, very colourful, and so on. But it's been very well covered. So... I wrote about the situation today, and I discovered that there's one really big theme about the islands today, which I'll come on to in my third part of this, 
of this talk, which is the fact that they're being museumified. Um, but that's not uh, unique to the islands, but anyway, they are. So I set off on my little boat from here, from Isla, and went up. And uh, I, one of the things I really realized is that the past in the Hebrides is there in the present. I mean, that's, that sounds like a trite thing to say. Obviously, it's the case if you go to Red Square or Edinburgh Castle or to Oakham Castle and Loch Ness. But there's something almost more to it than that in, in that within the Hebrides, memories are, are, are very long. And Isla, since the 17th century, has been a Campbell Island. And the number of people on that island whose name is Campbell um, is just extraordinary. And we had a, I had a rather amusing experience about this with, uh, when I lived in Tarbot here, which is, is, is an honorary Hebridean island, in the, for a reason I'll explain in a minute. Um, but I lived there, and I had a, a friend who came up to stay with me. I didn't really know him particularly well. He was a friend of a friend. And he, he was writing, and he wanted to come up and have a bit of peace in my little cottage in Tarbot. And so after a couple of days, I said, well, one evening, let's go down to the pub. And this guy was from London, and he was black. He was completely, you know, he was from, I don't know where he was from, but he was totally black. He was a nice guy. Went down to the pub, and all these, all these, um, all these builders were in the pub. And, of course, the legend in, in everywhere around Argyle is that the wicked people are the Campbells, because the Campbells used to dominate that area. I'm just telling this about the connection of the way the past influenced the present. The Campbells used to dom dominate the area. All the people in Isla half people. Island of Campbells, etc. Et <coughs> <coughs> and in fact, uh, Don, um, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, when he goes to stay at Ardlassa up here in Jura, um, it's, it's uh, Campbells uh, that he, well, he goes to stay with the people, they call called Fletcher, but um, the Fletcher is a sect of the Campbells. He anyway, went into the pub, and this guy was black, and, and he was trying to be friendly to everyone. They're all trying to be sort of friendly to him in a, in a sort of Scottish Hebridean way. And it, I, I, where are you from then? And he said, oh, London. No, 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 no. I don't know what's wrong with Who cares about London? Where are you from? <laughs> what they wanted to mean, is he from t Jamaica or Trinidad or what have you? And eventually he, he, he said, no, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm part, I'm, I'm, I've got a bit of Scottish blood in me myself. Um, I, 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 what, how's that? He said, well, my middle name is MacDonald. Now, the MacDonalds and the Camden. Well, enemies. Anybody who's heard about the uh, Glen Coe massacre will know that. You're McDonald's. And they were sort of, you know, and they were all sort of, you know, pretending to be shocked by this. They said, well, okay, okay. And they sort of go in the huddle, okay. But you're sure you're not a Campbell? <laughs> and, <coughs> no, McDonald's, no. But you're sure you're not a Campbell, etc., etc. So the past is very much there. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, it's got the end of a cough. Anyway, the history of the Hebrides really begins as far as we know it, and stress that because there's a lot of Hebridean history which we don't know about. You see remains, uh, especially some of the standing, there's a standing, a series of amazing standing stones, a little bit like Stonehenge, <coughs> called the Ring of Brodga up in Lewis. But as far as we, <clears throat> the, the, the kind of known period of Hebridean history begins when the Vikings arrived. And the Vikings came from Norway, and they came all the way down the, the west coast. They went down here, down to Dublin eventually. And there was a long period in the Hebridean history when it was ruled by the Vikings from Orkney uh, directly and indirectly from Trondheim in Norway. And uh, it was only in 1263 that the Scottish crown finally took over the Hebrides, although it did not take over the Northern Isles, Orkney and Shetland, until the 15th, late 15th century, for another 200 years. But for a long time it was, it was Viking, and I met a very, when I was on the Isles of the North trip, I met a very interesting man up in Harris here, uh, Harris is there, um, who was an expert on uh, Viking history, and he's one of the few people who was a native Gaelic speaker, but also fluent in Old Norse. And he explained to me, and this is 
no time of the year where you get really very hot weather. However, my mother was from up here, a place called Benetti, uh, near Bucky. No, it's up there. Um, and she, she just told me that when they were young, I mean, she grew up really in Aberdeen, but when she was very young, they were there. And she said, up there, the weather was wonderful in the summer. And because the rain had dropped over the highlands and the wind had gone, and, you know, they're on the east coast of, of, of Scotland, which is, the, you know, I mean, for example, Edinburgh, the weather's much better in Edinburgh than in Glasgow, for the same reason. Um, and she said they used to have lovely weather up there, warm and everything, because there's a bigger land mass and they're away from sea. But the Hebrides, no, it's never very hot in the summer, and it's never very cold in the winter, and it's never the same. It's never boring. The weather is never boring. And the reason British people in general, but particularly the Hebrides, talk about talk about the weather all the time is because it's actually interesting. What's happening up there? Oh, oh I see there's a change on now, and oh, I, you know, it's getting, the wind's getting up, you know, and then so on. So no, it's the, the weather is yeah, it's very very different weather from Russia. Let's put it that way. That back is somewhere up there somewhere. I don't know. I, I don't know. I've never been to back in the I've been to store it was at the back. But if you key that in, you will find this thing. This man sitting in his church, and then it lasts about 10 minutes, and, it, and it's interspersed with lots of shots of the landscape of the, of the area. Absolutely beautiful. And you see how the, the sound of the language fits in somehow with the, lang with the landscape. It's, it's quite uncanny. There's a lot of the sea. You can hear the sound of the sea. There's, there's obviously beaches everywhere. And you hear the sound of the, 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 the surf, and, and it sort of goes in with the singing, and it's, it's just very, very beautiful. But sadly, I'm afraid to say, um, you don't really hear it much anymore. And part of the reason for that is that a lot of the people that I knew, uh, maybe a bit older than me, but they, they had been to school in the islands in the, in the John Finley, told me he was, a, he was from Fife, and he moved to Ireland in the 1950s, a farmer, and he said when he first came to Isla, the entire business of the Isla Farmers Union, which was quite powerful, there were a lot of quite successful farmers in Isla, they did all their business in Gallic. He didn't speak a word, he came to fight, he didn't know what they were talking about. But, um, yeah, I used to make a rule at home in my family that um, if uh, you know, I, I used to say to my children, they were quite young, that um, it's very rude to talk about other people when they're. Because they would say, they would say, no, what's Dad doing? Do? What is this? What do you want to be? I said, no, 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 you're not allowed. It's very rude. You're not allowed to do that. And then, then I thought to him, I said, well, if you want to talk about me or Mum, you've got to say it in Gaelic, because we won't understand. <laughs> so suddenly it was all, oh, oh, Dad. <laughs> that was about the only way I could encourage them to use Gaelic. Uh, no, I'm afraid the, the sad truth of, is that Gaelic is, <coughs> along with a lot of these small languages, really is, is dying. Do you remember when you were at school, or what kind of books did you write in the school? Maybe you can advise these students. Well, I, I was... You were an era, I think. Yeah, there's two of them. You were then all traditional books. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they're both, there's, there's two on there, and they're both new. Um, uh, Loch Ramza, one of them, um, and I forget the name of the other one. They're both at Loch Ramza, I think, as far as I know, which is at the top end of the island here. Um, but no, I, I've got a friend who started at Kilhoman, which is the smallest place here in Scotland, on a farm over this side of the island. And they don't really, because the thing is that the, the, the stuff stays in the cask for anything from 8 to 15 years. So, you know, the market going up and down like that, it really, you know, it's really smoothed out. And the international demand has not suffered materially. And so, you know, to be honest, and there, I read just the other day that there's going to be a new one up near Kalila. Kalila's, um, just over here, Kalila's Gallic sound of the island, which is the sound meaning the, the stretch of water between island and Europe. 
And there's one story that was the leader, near a place you may have heard of it called the Grove Fabric, uh, the Buddha Harbour. Yeah, and then they're going to start a new one there, apparently, just off the mission. It's a, the, the person who's starting it, interestingly enough, is a whiskey bottler from Glasgow. So he's a guy who blends it and sells it. So apart from, you know, whiskey and, you know, the pipes and the goods and everything, the, the thing that they really like is the whole kind of, the whole Hebridean um, music and dancing and, you know, there's a, the Russian people, if they go to Britain, they prefer to go to Scotland, if they go to Scotland, they prefer to go to the, the Highlands, they prefer to go, if they like to go to the Highlands, they prefer to go to the Islands. That's, I would say, is a pretty general rule in Russia. And uh, not many people do get to the islands. They get to the highlands a lot, because that's very easy to do tourist-wise. They go and see the castles and try and look to see the Loch Ness Monster, which is very mm -hmm. extraordinarily popular in Russia. Um, and I said to some, I, I once was involved with the island marketing group, and I said, why don't we try and invent a monster for Loch Ness <laughs> And, you know, get some into fakes and memoirs and sightings and Photoshop, and, but uh, it didn't happen. So. And some words about the religion, probably in your mm -hmm. place and in Russia, what kind of religion? Well, most of the islands, most of the islands are really, <coughs> like the rest of Scotland, are, are Protestant, Presbyterian uh, type of thing, except for um, Barra. And there are places in the mainland of the Highlands that are Catholic, but it's mostly Protestant. And some of the outside, outlying islands, like Lewis, and there are places in the islands, there are places everywhere where you will find the free church, which is an extreme Calvinist form of church. Um, and um, but I think the, the thing that you'd say in general about religion is that, quite honestly, people are it's a bit like Gallic. It's just died really. They never mm -hmm. It's not particularly well, it's not dead by any means, but it's not particularly popular. And the other thing is that unlike in Russia, it doesn't have any sort of state or political role. It's just you know, religion. It's not it's not part of um, any kind of um, sort of combined presentation of the symbols of power or whatever. It's just it's just a bit more like in America, it's just, it's just yeah. and in fact the interesting thing is if you go to, I always say this you go to Northern Ireland, we used to go to Myla down there's a, every year, there's an incredible um, uh, thing called the Old Lamosphere. This is Patrick's Day, so let's talk about Ireland for one second. In Valley Castle, which is a place, now this is Rathlin Island, we used to go and um, stay there. But if you go to Valley Castle and you go around our, in Northern Ireland, the Protestant bit, because the, you know, the Southern Ireland from here down is just Patrick. Well, Walmart, every single street corner has a different church on it. <coughs> you know, there's a, you know, it might, might have one branch, might have three branches, and anybody who wants to start a church just gets a building, has some followers, gets some money, <coughs> the church. And that's really the um, that's really the sort of extreme aspect of Protestantism. And um, whereas Catholicism is one huge great thing that stretches from one end of Europe to the other. And the whole idea of Protestantism is that everybody does their own thing. But the thing is, is in Scotland, um, unlike Ireland, strange thing, I don't know why it should be, but in, in Scotland, really, people are not particularly interested. In Ireland people still are. There's a lot of, and in fact, if you go to Lewis, the, the church observance in Lewis up in the north amongst the extreme Protestants is very strong. And I'd say that's the only place in the I remember once being in the, on my boat in Stornoway on a Sunday, and all the pubs are shut on a Sunday in Stornoway, which is very worrying. And um, <laughs> we were sitting on the boat, and we'd heard there was one pub that was open for a couple of hours, because um, we just sailed in that day, and we had to leave you know, pretty well the next day or something, I can't remember exactly, but we didn't have much time. <coughs> we were keen to go to have a couple of times <coughs> whole town was quiet and you think, you think everybody was dead 
and we went back just a year to the time of the referendum. Everybody knew what they wanted. They thought. Um, in fact, the opinion was divided, but everybody was very strong in their opinion. The, the people who wanted, wanted to Scotland independent were very strident, very noisy, very definite, very in your face about it. <coughs> the people who wanted to vote no to stay in the United Kingdom, who ended up being the majority, um, said nothing at all, but made sure they voted, and they won. On this debate, which was more about the European Union thing, they tried, they deliberately tried to keep it to the European Union subject and stay away from Scotland. Uh, Scotland, well, the thing is that the, the, the Scottish National Party has said if Scotland votes to stay in Europe and England votes to stay out, then there needs to be another referendum. Now, this was hotly contested, to my surprise. I think that my own impression from this program opinion has changed a great deal in the last year, a year and a half. Now, um, the change, who knows exactly how far it will be, but if there's a change, the change will be in the direction of keeping things as they are. Um, that will be staying in Britain, and in Europe, I think it's less so. Now, I don't know, I'm, I, this is me just trying to Yes, as I talked to quite a few people in Scotland on Skype from time to time, um, but I don't have any special inside knowledge.